Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, together with Guinness. Hello and welcome to episode two of season two of House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe together with our very good friends at Guinness. And this week, I'm relatively nervous because normally when you are alongside James Haskell, who is allergic to anything to do with rugby, one can look quite intelligent when you talk about the game. But this week we have got two fully fledged rugby noises. Well, one rugby noise and one highly qualified (laughs) rugby guru. I'm going to go with rugby guru. (laughs) Uh, Nice to have Bob Vickerman back once again. How are you? Hello, sir. First Guinness, though, sir. Looking, we don't know how well this could go. Looking looking a little sunburnt, if I might say. Yeah, I'd, I'd burn for fun. I'd burn in Yorkshire, <laughs> mate. That's how bad it is. True that. We need to turn the lights down a little bit. It's a great pleasure to have with us Mr Jerry Flannery. Thank you. 41 caps for Ireland, selected for the Lions Tour, European Cup winner. Um, until May was the forwards coach at Munster, it says here. But, I mean, there's a whole lot more that I'd like to get into. I've actually just scribbled down Love Island, Pub and Arsenal. <laughs> Do you want to start with rugby or would you like to start with... A bit more about you. How are you? You look very well. I mean, is that is that because the stresses of having to do the day to day of what you were doing last season with Munster is no longer there, or have you had a bit of a holiday? Or uh, I have are, you, a, are you settling into life as a media magnate? Um, I don't know. I, I'm definitely not a magnate. I'm I'm just just adjusting to what life is like outside of professional rugby. Yeah. And it's like I was chatting to to Andrew Trimble when we did the last House of Rugby, and he was just saying about um the one in Ireland. He, he was making the point about you almost retire twice then because most players when they come out when they retire they struggle with the lack of structure yeah and I probably was I probably never had that because I retired and I went into a master's and then I was into into back into professional sport again and now I've stepped out and now I I I, I genuinely do find it difficult like I get up and I go is this it is this am I am I doing enough am I you know so it's difficult that way but like you just It'll work out. Yeah. It's, you know? a very, it's a very good attitude to have. I, yeah. I I can guarantee that given everything you've got going on, something will arrive to sink your teeth into if you haven't got enough already. Can I ask you about Munster? Why Why no more? Uh, it's a good question. I, I love the club and um, I, I love the job. You know, it was a fantastic. Like I, I, str- I really struggled coaching at the start. I think if you speak to most coaches, if they're honest, they'll tell you that when you first go in there, it's actually really tough. Yeah. Because you're you've you've no real experience in that role, and you've got all these players. It's a real demanding environment because the players are there on short term contracts. They want to succeed straight away. They don't want to say, "Listen, we'll afford you a couple of years of grace or a, a year's grace while you get up to speed," because that's that's a year that they could potentially go on and win something. So I found the first couple of years tough, and then uh, I absolutely loved it. It was a dream job for me. It was a difficult decision to step out of it, and Munster made me a really, a really generous offer. Was it a personality thing, or a, a direction of the club thing, or my, my personality? No, not your personality. <laughs> was it you know working with other personalities, or was it? There's, it, it? You can't put it down to one thing. It was just didn't feel right. It didn't feel right for me, and what I was conscious of that it the easiest thing to do is is just to take the contract again because it's good money and and mm. and it's a job that you love, but. For me, like I have a pub in Limerick and I have so much of my, of the, I don't know, does this sound a bit, a bit wishy or not? Go for it, far into it. Is this a bit wanky to say like I have so much equity built up in my name based on my, what I've done with Munster. I don't want to sully that because if it doesn't feel right, yeah, then it's not going to go well. Yeah. And um, it's just the fact that it happened so late in the season meant that the avenue for me of going, staying and coaching professional rugby was 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 gone really uh, like to make a to make a lateral move at least yeah you know from Munster is going to be very very difficult so I was left with the choice of saying well I can ride this out it doesn't feel right for me and your family are the ones who generally end up having to sacrifice no my family didn't have to sacrifice as much as if you look at Johan van Graan as at the travel uproot his family from South Africa Graham Rowntree uprooted his family from England Stephen Larkham uprooting his family from Australia JP Ferrara all the coaches mm. have had to travel from South Africa Australia New Zealand or England I haven't had to do that because I live like 10 minutes from the ground I can run down there but it just didn't feel right for me and I just said look I'm, I'm going to take a year out and it's not not a financial thing because there's lots of ways to make money but what what will fulfill you I don't know I not at the end of this year I might be like geez I I, I haven't really enjoyed the year you know really? even if you make a few quid it doesn't matter if, if so, so does this feel like a time out or a full stop uh, a time out for me 
Okay. It's kind of like just testing the waters and and was chatting with Rob beforehand about how much rugby I've been watching since you know since it since it kicked off. More or less. Just well the same as I would have been when I was coaching, okay. but like couldn't get enough of it. Like kind of like one of those guys who who I used to hate when I'd meet them and they'd be like, Oh, I watched a lot of rugby doing you know what you should be doing. And I was like, Oh, shut up, man. Yeah. You know, but yeah. You go from a coach to a nose, mate. Welcome yeah, to, welcome yeah. to the club. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. You are very welcome. <laughs> the fact you've both bought notebooks today, I think is I think that must be a first. I don't think at least I've ever had a double notebook. Yeah, I've stolen that, you can have that back. We are going to get on to, obviously, England. I want to talk Ireland as well. Yeah. Just before that, when you're talking about, obviously, being on a timeout, are you looking to get back into rugby? Or I'd love to, I basically want to ask you about the Arsenal experience and how that came about and what you learnt and what you enjoyed and what you hated and mm. who impressed you. Would you is, is rugby the next port of call? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 not, it's, it's, it's not going to be football again. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. <clears throat> I, I don't... So what were you, sorry, what were you doing there? You were strength and conditioning? Yeah, so to put a timeline, I when I had a lot of injuries towards the end of my career, so I probably you know when when they were compounding along, I said okay, well I've got to make some plans for. I'm not sure how long my body's going to hold up. So I'd seen a lot of my that era that I'd played with Munster. I'd seen them all retire before before me. I'd seen what some people have done that had worked for them, and what some people have done that that I obviously went. I don't want to do that. So I didn't want to get any big surgeries as I retired. Yeah. I didn't. I wanted to try and minimise the amount of change in my life and have as much structure as I could. So I signed up for a master's in in uh, the university in Limerick on sports performance because I said, listen, most guys when they retire, that year that they retire is probably a, a bit of a wanky year when they don't really do anything. You know, they, they try things, but they don't go anywhere. I said, yeah. at least I'll be upskilled by the end of that year. Yeah. And and I did that. I did that at uh, the master's and it gave me good structure and it gave me something to focus myself on rather than, you know, seeing the lads going for coffees and be like, well, well what are we doing, you know? You, you, what you've just said there rings very, very familiar with another person who's in this studio quite quite regularly. Mind you, he's so busy. He's, he's not quite got the structure, but he's certainly trying things. Yeah, there. I saw him driving a tank. The yeah, other yeah, I know. Oh my <laughs> God, I like, Where I know. is it going? And then I got a phone call from one of my old coaches um, when I was at Connacht. His name is Des Ryan. He is the... He was the head of like long-term athletic development in the RFU. So when a kid picks up a ball, he was my uh, strength and conditioning coach and I was in Connacht. Then he moved up to the ranks and he was in charge of what happens, what is the pathway for young lads yeah. uh, or for young girls when they're playing rugby in Ireland. And he was presenting and he got seen by, I think it was Trevor Sabin, who is a rugby man. Um, he's the head of recruitment at Arsenal, but he's a, he's a big Harlequins man. And he saw this and went, this would be good for Arsenal, you know, because... I think that the FA had brought out the the FA had brought out kind of um, directives that they were saying that football there's so much money in football in England, yeah. but the national team the players weren't coming through as as they th they thought they should have. So they said we to get your funding from the Premier League you've got to have a certain amount of S and C coaches you've got to have a a full time director of sports science a full time uh, head of academy you you've got to do all this so. So the clubs had to go out and recruit all these people. So my, my, my mate got recruited there and he rang me then and said, listen, he said, you, you, you've done that master's, haven't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you want to come over to Arsenal for a year? And I went, oh, uh, I don't know about that. And he said, come over and have a look. So I flew over and um, at the time there was actually a pretty good Irish connection there. Gary O'Driscoll is the doctor in Arsenal. Yeah. He still is. He was the doctor. He's still there, is he? Yeah. He was the doctor. Well, I haven't checked, but yeah, yeah. he was yeah, there yeah. last year. Yeah. Um, but, Gary was there who was the doctor with the national team when I played with Ireland That's right. and Declan Lynch who was a physio he was at London Irish he was at Bath he was a head of medical at Bath he was there and he was working he, he was working there and um, obviously Jerry Payton as well <laughs> the, the, the goalkeeper played a bit for Ireland um, the goalkeeping coach so they, I went around then I went around the club and uh, I was a Chelsea fan when I was a kid I went over to Arsenal anyway and I had I just wanted to see what it was like and uh, and Declan Lynch, the physio, just said to me, he said, listen, if your life is a book, yeah, wouldn't this be a really interesting chapter to have in there? And uh, I was like, oh, shit, he's right. I said, look, I said, I can guarantee I can do six months. So I'll do I'll do up to Christmas and uh, rent an apartment in St. Albans. Yeah. And uh, Saracen's land. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> um, I would I would uh, I started work and I thought I thought that it would be far more of a, a lifestyle where I'd be, you know, we, we always had this view. I think me and most of the lads in Munster, when we played that, 
oh, the lads over in Wasp now they're probably going to see Beyonce on a Thursday night and then, <laughs> then they're going for a bit of a captain's run and then they're going for some fancy meals and Beyonce. Uh, yeah, well, whatever yeah. man you know, see Lawrence, I'm, just, I'm just saying it that like London is such yeah. a hub whereas Limerick is okay. not is not and is... that was the chip that fired you to you, <laughs> two European trophies wasn't it yeah well, we, uh, what, but I said oh, it'd be good to go over there and, and, but when I went over I didn't realise like I was I was scared of the commute so that's why I lived so close that's why I lived in St Albans and I was like this place is pretty quiet around here there's not really much happening and then then I, because it was my first time in a new job, I threw myself into it. I was working six days a week and I was studying all the time as well, trying to make sure I could stay ahead of things. And um, I probably didn't enjoy it enough to start with. Right. It. I found it quite overwhelming. Um, not overwhelming. I just found it. A lot going I, on. I wasn't getting on the piss. I wasn't going out for dinner. You right. know what I mean? And when my missus would be there to me, come on, we'll do this. I'd be like, I'm exhausted. So then, because she, she was basically, she just did a bit of work, a bit of work experience like with, and it was a, it was a great laugh for her yeah. of course um so then she moved back to start college again in september and then i just went through with um johnny o'connor came over as well yes that's we right, used to play yeah. with wasps yeah um and the two of us were there johnny had a, still had a house in richmond from when he played with wasps so he he was there his wife was there and uh they had their son and then they had another another kid um and so johnny was like trying to you know I, it's not like i had a real social circle there yeah. you know um, but then when I got to Christmas, then um, oh, I just said, "Listen, I'm I'm done now, lads. I've done my six months." And they said, "Oh, we'd love you to stay." And I said, "Oh, it's just, just I'm just not having enough of a life here." So they said, "What if you flew over and back?" So I flew over and back every week. Then, so ah, I got to go home. Yeah. So then I said, "Yeah," and I saw it out. And as this, and all the while when I was there, I would start. I would pop down to Mark McCall and Phil Morrow was was my S&C coach with, at the last World Cup with Ireland yeah. and uh, he's a great guy and, and Mark McCall they were really really open to me and at the time there was uh, one of the back rows that was there a South African back row I'm trying to remember his name now he played with Munster as well he was there and I, I, I go down to Saracens and they were very open they booed me when I first came into the first team <laughs> meeting but they were like I remember someone just said to me see this kid here he's going to be good. It was Maro, oh, I told yeah, you. And I was like, was. oh yeah. shit, man. Yeah. And, uh, and I go down to, went down to Quinns, down to Colin O'Shea, uh, you know, was knocking in around London Irish. So I was keeping my, I was keeping my eye in around rugby and then I got a phone call. Then Arsenal had said to me, listen, we want you to stay on full time, move your missus across, you'll be finished college. And I was considering it and I said, what if we moved into London City? I said, that might be a lot better. Yeah. And um, I still just wanted the experience, you know, and, um, I had found it once I got a bit of a social life. I found the job was much much, much easier to tolerate, and um, my missus was keen. And then I got a phone call from Anthony Foley saying, "Listen, uh, I'm taking over as the head coach uh, from Rob Penny. Would you be interested in coming back?" And I said, "To do what?" And he goes, "He goes, I, I need someone to coach the scrum." Yeah. And my initial reaction was like, "Oh man, I won't be ready for that." And then I thought, so I just realized then that, like I said, okay, I'm not very experienced, but I'll work hard at it. And I said, the remit is narrow enough that I don't think I'm going to hurt Munster by taking it. If yeah. they'd asked me to coach the forwards from the start, I said, like, this is not, that's beyond me. Yeah. Oh. And just, that's where I started with it. And Quick five questions. Ars Arsene Wenger, brief description. Uh, no one would, I, I played some of the, some of the games. We used to have like, he, he used to, like football. Yeah, we used to play the, 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 the staff, like they love football, man. They absolutely love it. Yeah. So they organised a couple of games and then a couple of times they said, listen, do you want to come out and play? So you play. Then you realise that nobody touch it, touches Arsene Wenger. Like he gets the ball protected. and you're like, how has he afforded so much time on the ball? It's because no one, everyone's afraid to tackle him. Oh, did you nail him? Did you nail him? No, he was on my team. Ah. But I tell you, um, I was just chasing shadows. I looked like such a fat idiot running around. And, you're, just, and you were a relatively good footballer at a young age? Uh, I was yeah I, I think I was good yeah I thought I was pretty good but then so this, you got game. this was this was on a different level for me you know I was just chasing shadows and then Steve Bold was there to me stop chasing just hold your position you know and I was like okay okay and then um, Jens Lehmann and myself got into it a little bit and he caught me with an elbow and split me and they were and really? then yeah he's 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 tough man he's did tough you, did you take it or did you retaliate for the good of uh I'm not sure. It wasn't like he came over and elbowed me. It was. It was, it was he probably saw like the Irish guys running around trying to hack people a little bit, and he goes, "I'm going to give these guys a little bit of a taste." But like Robert Perez, all of the, the what's what's really nice about Arsenal is like you would get Saul Campbell. Robert Perez was playing. Yeah. Um, 
Phil Morrow, uh, Phil Morrow, who I remember when they won the Coca Cola Cup and they were celebrating. Did they, go, dropped they break his leg, didn't they? I think it was his, his, oh, his arm. arm was it? Like, yeah. Oh my lord! But he was playing, and um, Steve Bold. Uh, there was there was a couple of other lads, but it was um, yeah, it was it was it was amazing. I got my eyes open to football, like it was. The, the difference, but uh, particularly coming from Munster, which is sort of very, it's a tight circle, Munster, yeah. and it's, you know, it's it's salt of the earth as opposed to Premier League, which is diamonds and flashy shoes and, and everything yeah. goes with it. I've heard that all the footballers have their own personal trainers rather than that one ounce strength and conditioner. I think, yeah, there was some of the lads there who probably didn't have as much faith in the S&C that they were getting, um at senior level and they probably went away and did, did different things. Um, when, when I came in, you see, it's, it's dramatically different now. So Arsenal were being really, really proactive. Yeah. I, 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 wouldn't, I could never bad mouth the club. They were being really proactive about developing the players. But I came in and the players that when like, I coached Alex Iwobi was one of my players who just went to, just went to Everton for 35 million. Yeah. Wow. And I did, was you, like, did you get a cut of that? Having <laughs> brought him on the way? Steve Ball just really, really like what Alex is doing. I'd be like, Phew what does this guy know man this guy he can't front squat you know and he'd be like Alex is really really good and uh, I, I, Johnny O'Connor rang me one day he goes flick on put on the TV he goes there there's Lionel Messi and Alex Iwobi playing against each other and I was like okay shows and Hector Bellerin was one of the lads that we had um, so they're Arsenal's point from Arsenal's point of view they're going to have an academy yeah. and they're going to have all these players if they have a really strong pathway and if they've got good coaches in around them there's a duty of care on those players when they're young because they get paid so well, so young. They get paid before they've achieved anything. They get paid like in rugby, you, you'll, you'll not give a guy a, a big contract based on potential. He'll have to perform for the senior team to get to get that money. Whereas in Arsenal, they go, this kid's 16. Oh, if we don't sign him up now on a five-year someone deal, else someone else will sign him. So they say, that kid is 16. He's negotiated a contract where he's going to be on 10, 12 sterling a week. And then he has this... Hang on, what, thousand? Yeah, and he'll turn around <laughs> then and I'll be there to him. I'll be like, listen, so if you think of it, the dynamic for that kid at 12, he may never have deliberately grafted to get better at his job. He might have just been a really good player who's just played football with his mates all the time, never said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on this or I'm going to work on that. And then, so, and then, he's, then he's paid. So that, that's a value that everyone goes, well, you're successful now. And then he gets this old retired rugby player coming out and saying, you need to graft now. And he's like, Pfft. I don't need to graft because every decision he's made up to this point has been vindicated because now he's he's a got what he potentially wanted. a millionaire. He's got two and a half million contract for five years. Did you get twelve percent of that? I got nothing, man. Oh, mate. I got nothing. He's Although the food, I have to. The food in Arsenal. If you're asking about Arsenal Wenger, the food was on a different level. I've never come across it, and what disgusted me when you go up to the food, the the chef there was. It was amazing. You go up there and they have a salad bar with, with there'd be lobster, there would be fillet steak, there would be fish options, there'd be everything. And we used to go up and eat so much. And then I'd be sitting there and I'd see some of the academy lads walking past me and they'd have like white bread with butter. And I'd be like, get that shit off your plate, man. And then some of them would, would bounce and go down to, down to McDonald's around the corner. And I'd be like, lads, you are getting the best of food, like whatever. Did, did you? Did you? Did you? Do you feel you made an impact with them as people, or is it? Is it uh, the, the accusation is there's no getting through? I mean, did, did, uh, I think. No, do you know I, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Good, good people are good people. I think that there's uh, there's a lack of com comparatively to rugby. I think there's a lack of trust and accountability in football. That that's what I, what I experienced. Yeah. Which Arsenal were trying to work on. The players will be in all the time. Yeah. So if the players are in all the time, they're going to train with the handbrake on because they never feel like, when am I going to get a break? But they're probably concerned that the players are going to go out drinking on it. You know, if the, play, if the reserve is playing a Tuesday night, yeah. they might say, listen, you've got to be in for your recovery on a Wednesday. And it's, I think, I think it's sometimes it, it, it went right through. It went right through the senior side. You know, like they'd, they might have a Champions League game and they come back on a Tuesday and they'd be in on a Wednesday. And I'd be like, why don't, you know, we, we, and How do they switch off? Why, why don't you just let them stay in bed, man? Because that's the best recovery they can have. And they said, well, what if they rock up on then on Thursday and they said they've got a niggle and they can't train? You know, and I said, well, you just tell them if they've got, if they've got a niggle, they come, in and, they come in on Wednesday. If they don't, they stay in bed. And they're like, oh, it's not going to work. Like there was some things that were, and that's where Arsenal, because Arsenal, like I came in at this, at say the senior academy level. Yeah. With guys who were 17, 18, um, they, they did this from, from nine. 
So at nine years of age. Now, if you went in there now and dealt with 16 year olds, they would have seven years of training where it's just part of their regime. They go in and they practice Olympic lifting from a young age, you know, real strong pathway. So yeah. it's just part of their job. Whereas the kids that I coached the previous year, they would go out and they would play football for probably two and a half hours on the pitch. They come in, they might, um, they might have their lunch and they, and they go off home. Whereas then when we came in, we said, listen, you come in in the morning, you do your monitoring. Yeah. This is, and the, this, this felt to them like a little bit like, oh, you're just making my day longer now. They'd have to do their monitoring in the morning. Then they'd go off and they'd have their prehab work. They had, if there were certain areas that to work on, they'd do that with us. Then they'd go with the football coaches. We'd warm them up and we'd, you'd be trying to work with the football coaches to, you know, I had to learn quite a lot as well. Like that rugby is, or rugby is so different to football because it's such a, Foot, football is such a skill-based sport compared to rugby at, and it's such an early specialisation sport so that most guys when they play rugby have played a lot of sports all the way up and then yeah. around 18 they physically mature and they, they they find their position. Most kids that are that are in the system are just playing football non-stop. Full stop. So like you might see these guys who are ninjas on the field but they can't jump and land on, they can't ju jump onto a box and bend their knees they they don't have that ability yet they're not phys fully physically literate so you're trying to you're trying to catch up on those things and for the players that we had you know then they'd be on the pitch training then they they come in they'd have their lunch and then we'd say right we've got you've got you've got your gym sessions now you know and and we might be doing some olympic lifts we might be doing some mobility you know and so their day suddenly got way longer and they're like, well, hang on a second. Why, why is this happening? And I said, this is actually what it should be for you. Um, but it was a, it's, it's a bit of a sell when you're asking people to do twice as much work than yeah. they've done in the past. And I think for some of the staff in Arsenal at the time as well, um, kit men and stuff like that who were used to finishing, you know, collect all the jerseys at, at, at one o'clock and their day is done. Then they're there at half four, four waiting, going, come on, you know. But it was, I think look you see the quality of players that are coming out of there yeah. now and Alex being sold for 35 million that's just that's Incredible. we got we used to train at Chelsea's ground back yeah. in the M M25 M4 connection and two of the lads were late because they were spinning Damien Duff's 22 inch rims you're that, kidding me like, at eight, well 80,000 pound a wheel the lads were saying and it was the same week that Lampard and Terry had a bet who would get their Aston Martin Vanquish delivered faster Loser to pay for the other ones. Oh, and they're going, are we just going to go out and uh, train a bit now then, lads? So we're going to just admire all these uh, wheels here. But it's a different world, isn't it? Different it's crazy. world. It is. And I'm wondering, the point you make is, for a lot of kids who, who, who graduate up to train with the senior academy, they suddenly rock up and that's, that's, that's London Colony. That's where the first team is. When they pull up to training, there's like, there's all these Ferraris and stuff. And they're suddenly like, well, this is life now. This is the way it is. You know, they, and... Some of these kids aren't going to make it. You know, like I remember Terry Burton was there to me and he said like the failure rate in football is catastrophic. And he said to make it in Arsenal is actually so difficult because if you put yourself in the position of the manager, if, if the centre half gets injured, I can take a, take a shot on this kid here and put him out there. And if it, do, if it doesn't go well, I get lambasted. Or I can just go and sign this guy who's a, who's a, you know, a seasoned <laughs> international for, for 35 million, put him in. And if he makes an error, it's on him. Yeah. So it's so hard to make it, but it's just getting an opportunity is actually the key. So then for a lot of the kids, when they come in at that young age and they see that all the cars, they say, well, this is the way life is. And I was like, it's not. You know, it's and I, I, I would listen to them in the boot room. There was one of the lads there and he's a really good lad, but he was like, I overheard him having a conversation and he goes, listen, he goes, would you play for Villa <laughs> for 40 grand a week and start or would you go to Real on 82 and sit in the bench? And I could see the two, they were thinking about it. And I was like, I said, are you, are the two of you joking me, man? I said, you'll be over there in Sainsbury's packing, packing shelves, man, if you don't get your finger out, man. You know, and, you know, they're, they're good kids, but that's, that's what our, that's, that's what our heads are. are. You know, it's so weird. And, and it's the fact that, like, at least if, if, if someone doesn't make it in rugby, they're generally, if they're released from an academy, they're generally 22 years of age. They've grafted pretty hard. Yeah. They know what hard work is. And they know that, that money doesn't really come easy. And they take that work ethic and go into something else if it, if it didn't work for them in rugby. Whereas in football, if the kids don't make it, they're, they're, you've probably, from 11 years of age, you know, all your mates, there's, been a, there's a call every year. Yeah. And once you survive that call, everyone's going, Rob, you are a fantastic, you're going to play for England. You're so good. So you're not listening in school anymore. 
You know, you're not paying yeah. attention in school. And then you get to 15 and the money starts getting closer and closer. And you, you don't, you just, you just detach from the real world. It's, it's, it's a really, it's really tough for those kind of, for those young lads. That's why there's a, when they get into that academy system, you have to teach them what it is to graft and have a big work ethic. And I think one of the clubs that I was really, I was really impressed with was Southampton, who seemed to take a lot of the kids who were cut by Chelsea, by City, by Man City, by United at 16. Yeah. And they give them a second chance and the kids work so hard for them. And that's probably where they produce so many quality players and, and they ran a real disciplined um, program there. Interesting. Very quickly, because producer size ain't move on, move on. One sentence answers only. Best lad amongst the yes. Arsenal players that you, you played with. Who was the guy you thought? Special man. Uh, Jack Wilshire. Really? Yeah. He's, because? He's just, uh, he's everything that you would want in, a, in, a, in, a, in an athlete. He, he, he trains full out when he trains. He's very, very normal. He's very, very grounded. And uh, yeah, he's a warrior when it comes to training. You are watching and listening House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness with me, Alex Payne, alongside Rob Vickerman. Bob the man is back. And Jerry Flannery. And we could tour for a long time with your mm. stories. I wish we could, we would have longer. Still to come, we're also going to get stuck into England. You've done so many notes and you haven't yet had a chance to... Uh, multicolour pen as well, to, so I've gone hard out. pen. Yeah. No highlighter this week, which is no. a little disappointing. Um, and we're going to pick an England side from those left behind by Eddie Jones and compare it to Hask's starting 15 from last week. Interestingly, Hask went with Tio at 12 in his... World Cup quarterfinal start 2015, which just did. highlights what the man doesn't know about sport. Uh, now, though, if you uh, haven't already listened or watched Liquid Football, where in God's name have you been? Have a little listen to this. You want to talk about VAR? Oh, I want to talk we... about Norwich oh. first. So Nor before we say Liverpool, the yeah. but Liverpool lost the second half. The Norwich, the Norwich manager said, well, <laughs> we won the second half. Not many mm. teams have done that. Yeah. I'm thinking... <laughs> That would have been his team. I'm, well. you know, I'm thinking, come on, you've won the second half. But it's a, were, it's but a game of football <laughs> and you've not won the second half. How, <laughs> how many team talks have, uh, have you had when you've been down two, three or four at half time and the, the manager said, just go out and win the second half and the players have obviously took that. We had it at <laughs> you in the youth club. <laughs> 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 we won the second leg. Didn't make us winners, did it? That is Liquid Football with Kelly Cates. Every Monday here on Joe, you can subscribe now via iTunes or on YouTube. Please don't forget to join us on the House of Rugby Facebook group as well. There are thousands Upon thousands of you on there now, says producer Sai. You're curating it very well, very well at the moment, Sai. Keeping the peace, which is nice to see. It's going to be one of the places, apparently, where you can purchase uh, the range of House of Rugby merchandise, which will be available very shortly. What, Just Hask what, cliches. What would you like? What would you like? Um, it's got to be about sing song, and then Haskell, That's some sort of line about bits and pieces, because that is his go-to. I put into the WhatsApp group to Sai this week. I want a bits and pieces bell. So every. Ding. Every sentence ends with, uh, you know, we've been doing bits and pieces. And what we're going to do is we're going to get a bell on the desk. And every time he says it, we'll ding it. And at the end of the show, he'll have a £42 fine, which will go to the charity yeah. of his choice. I have got a suggestion as well for the end feature, but we might get into that later. I'd like to see another bell for how many times he's going to mention Craig David. Because he's now DJing with Craig David. In, in Ibiza. In Ibiza, yeah. Which beats his set in Ascot, which was in an empty marquee with a stray horse stuck inside <laughs> there. With no bass as well. He only had the treble to play with. Um, just before we get to rugby, we, while we were we were wittering away while um, Kelly was telling you about liquid football, come on, Jack Wilshire and the bat. Yeah, just uh, when you were comparing like Munster versus Arsenal, one of the one of the masseuses had a had a bet with Jack. Jack, they were on the bench, they were on the bed, and Jack just said, "I bet you you couldn't get a kiss at the top of the Eiffel Tower before the end of the day." You're in London at this point. We're in then London Colony, and the dude just jumped. Into his car, drove, got the got the channel tunnel across, up to the top of the Eiffel Tower, got a some some girl kissed her, five grand cash, cash, yeah. Oh God, I mean that's quite a good way to make a living. Actually, you do that this twice a week. You're on a pretty good. No number. comparable, is it? You can't compare that. What, to what, how, how would that compare with Newcastle or Yorkshire Carnegies? If you, <laughs> the only equivalent. This is what Thomas used back, to say. Back, is, is a your... thing. Exactly. If you ever used to say Dagenham and Redbridge, you had to go there and take a picture with the town <laughs> sign. <laughs> that would be it. <laughs> that, in a nutshell, is Championship Rugby exactly. against Arsenal football. Unbelievable. <laughs> England. Yeah. What do we make of it? I was I was really happy. Did you like, watch it live? Um, sadly not. No. no, I won't go into the sky details. But no, I didn't watch it live. I've watched it twice since. And I was very happy because I was a bit nervous before it, Jerry. I don't know if many people said this from an English perspective, but looking at the Welsh team, hearing about the tweaks and changes, I was thinking that Wales are going to win. 
the Sky Features talking up the 14 test streak. Mm. Thinking, oh God, the last thing we want is to try and pull up the Welsh confidence. But actually, fair play, England were quality. <laughs> Wales were terrible at the same time, yeah. but England were good. 29 hours as world number one. They are still, they were still, it was very funny, Scott Cornell on um, on our coverage on Sunday, actually. It was, it was fun while it lasted, etc. What did you make of, what did you make of England's performance on Sunday? The last trial. Um, did you watch it? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, I didn't watch it live. I watched it back and um, I saw a lot of, a lot of this, there's, I think for England's game to progress, they've got like they've got momentum winners in the pack. Like Billy Vunapola is is uh, on his day, he's unplayable. Like yeah. what, I know from dealing with him with Saracens that well, against Munster, he's just it's he's a wrecking ball. He's there's very few players who get to that level in sport who are markedly so physically dominant and and he's got he's got the handling and and fit now. That's the yeah. Do you know, he it? actually looks really quick. Yeah. I watched um, still England nineteen training. off stone. Watched England training last Thursday, and he—I mean—he's motoring up the middle. He looks, was, he looks quick. Was it not him who put the? What, did he do Gareth Anscombe's knee when Gareth? Do you remember Gareth Anscombe? He got a block Two down. Two kicks. He did. Yeah, I, I thought he did it on a kick. It looked it fairly innocuous. Kick. Yeah, he got a little nudge, which Barnsley pointed out. But it was—it was a kick. He did it first off, fifteen minutes in. Newton yeah. was like, "Oh, knee's not quite right." Yeah. Played on and did it twice since. So, a couple of ACLs. You know when it's gone, he should have just come off. But aside from that, yeah. But the, but the point is that. Is that the line speed yeah. that the hundred and twenty-two kilo number eight is bringing? He's he's getting so far up the field. And when I watched the European final, and I just saw the reads that he was making, he was getting so high up the pitch. Uh, I think he he had a couple of intercepts, didn't he, in the in the Champions yeah. Cup final? He's uh, he, he, you build your team around him. Well, yeah. not just him. That the reason why I like how fit they're looking. And clearly, if you have two months with Eddie Jones, you're going to get fit. But Cowan Dickey talk about wrecking ball he is but what's he about probably 16 stone but he plays like he's 19 stone as yeah. well like huge human and then you're coupling that now with the big Fijian monster out wide fucking a singer mm. who probably can't be shy off 18 stone either it's just those three alone if you get them as your spine of the team happy days Hines at nine as well yeah no, I'm not happy about this are you not I'm not happy about this because? Because I'm a staunch Danny Care supporter and have been for many years. But is that a northern thing or a quality thing? Well, both. But the, the snapshot is that he's been told, allegedly, I have to say, that he's not sharp enough. And that's what's riled me. Because if you're going to pick Danny Care for one quality, it's his sharpness. So Willie Hines, fair enough. He's been amazing for Gloucester. I think he's great. 32-year-old. Canterbury, a little bit of you know those type of classical Kiwi players. Good skill set. But then he got 55 minutes. Why take him off at 55 minutes without really testing in his capability and then putting him straight in? I'm, I don't know. I, if I were Danny Cow, I would be so upset with that decision to not take him on the back of Selected Williams. He sent a very, very quality tweet, Danny, just saying, well done to everyone selected and go well. So did Cipriano, actually. Yeah. Uh, humble. You wouldn't get that in football, would you, Jerry? Don't know. Definitely the not. fallout of Gaza when he wasn't selected for yeah. World Cup 98. Trash the hotel room. Um... Yes, yeah, so what about the performance? Because actually some young guns on, in there who... Mm. I mean, he's gone with youth in his World Cup squad. Can can you see why off the back of Sunday? Are you um, surprised? Well, I think younger players are easier to mould. Mm. And Eddie Jones seems to be a guy who... 36 days or whatever it is. Yeah. I think, I think Willie, the, Willie... I would agree with you. I, 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 the, English, the English squad, to me, the 31-man squad, looks short on specialist players. And yeah. then two tight heads. Yeah. Like two nines. Two nines. One uh, out and out eight. Yeah, uh, I I I I struggle to see it's particularly because it's so far away in Japan as well, and the the short turnarounds of games. I think that 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 could potentially bite them. I can see the value in Willie Hines, um, in terms of his management and closing out games. Yeah, but I I I would be bringing Danny Kerr if I was going if if I was the if I was the coach. Vindicated. Um, um, on the other side, I thought Curry was outstanding. Mm. I think that. The difference is going to be seen when, when whichever team, like England physically can match anyone and yeah. they'll be conditioned to a level. It's whether they have enough magic in their team. That's where the Cipriani, 
like I, I we we obviously playing Gloucester, we did a lot of work on on analysing him, and and he's he's a phenomenal player on the front foot, attacking phenomenal. Because what is what is it that makes him so dangerous? From a I think he's so balanced that you can't tell exactly what he's going to do when he's getting the ball. He can drop the ball onto either leg when he's kicking. He can he can pull off unorthodox passes. He moves really really well. So it's hard for defenses to read what he's going to do. He reminds he's quite like Joy Carberry. Yeah. Um, but I I think defensively he he's suspect. He's quite suspect. Um, yeah. now, do you do you compensate and just say listen? will allow for that to bring out one of these players because I think that the difference when you look at World Rugby you now when you look at all the teams that are going to be because it's so, it's going to be such an open World Cup the All Blacks it, it's it's so open now because because the All Blacks aren't playing well it's mm. not because everyone else is playing fantastically better rugby no one is playing at, at the level that the All Blacks can play at when they do play because of the skill set of their forwards that's what I believe the difference is yeah. is those passing forwards just creating space all the time so I think that it looks a little bit based on the power game, which is, you know, look, when they played Ireland they, in the Six Nations, they, they they mauled Ireland with it, you know. They yeah. were so powerful. And, and defences now, everyone is, even the even the Kiwis now are bringing, um, are bringing proper line speed, albeit they're not watching. They're not watching the ball. They seem still to be watching the man, but they're bringing proper line speed. So I think that you're going to see the kicking game is going to be, the aerial game is going to be huge. Which, which... Funny enough, Eddie Jones has said a number of number of times. He said he thinks it's going to be a very quick World Cup. The pace and the, you know the ball in play will be high, and the aerial game will be high, which sort yeah. of begs the Mike Brown question. Yeah, I've got another question just on the back of what Jerry's talking there about the specialism element. And you're exactly right. So, for those oh. people that that perhaps listening or watching that play the Saturday rugby where they'll train Tuesday and train Thursday, you have got limited amount of time to really practice your skill set. But when you get into the environment of time and professionalism with squads and variants, you look at how teams play differently. So when we're playing teams with the likes of Danny Kerr or Danny Cipriani, you'd be spending, of a training week, say, about 10 hours on the field, about six hours of that trying to get people used to how Danny Kerr or Danny Cipriani play. You'd put people in bibs and you completely change the way the training week went because of their specialisms. And we haven't picked them. So I'm there thinking, you want a point of difference. You want someone doing something truly unreadable as a defensive line. I and mean, you've called them. And for me, that's mind-blowing. So point of difference, in a high-fast game, Danny Kerr, Danny Cipriani, they could potentially pull out some absolute worlds. So to worlds. back up Eddie Jones, though, or to pose the question for Eddie Jones, he, he said that he felt that in the Treviso camp, some of the senior players dropped off. He didn't get from them what he wanted. And I just wonder, he's gone with youth because he feels the energy and he feels he can mould them. If you look at the yeah. All Blacks, who are at the moment... Their, their graph is, is heading downwards the accusation might be that they are holding on to players for too long and they've held them on for a, for a season too long would you would you can you spot why the All Blacks are, are not firing as the way that when they were tonked properly in Perth mm, and that, that follows a pretty average draw against the box and a very lacklustre win over Argentina can you see why the All Blacks <clears throat> are not where they want to be uh, f- f- from the uh, from the game at the weekend I, I don't know specifically what players you're saying they might be holding on to. I Just think, I think they, Reeds and Smith, I mean, these are some of the best players in the world, but, you know, we <laughs> yeah. are heading, at the moment, they are on reputation some of the best players in the world, but mm. they're in a New Zealand side that lost and shipped 47 points to the Wallabies. I, yeah. Red I, card. You've got to throw that in a there. Red card, like, New Zealand were still in the mix right up till the red card and then it's going to be difficult, but I thought the difference was the work rate from the, from the Australian f- f- tight five. Yeah. The amount, I think they had 30 carries more than the than the New Zealand front five, and normally the difference is you see you see the magic plays from from the from the outside backs in when you're watching the All Blacks perform really well, and you go, oh, they've got those odds. But it's actually the fact that Joe Moody has got the ball and he's run hard at the line. He's got another forward running, and he's, he just pulls this perfectly crisp pass back, and they can get the ball to the edge, and everyone has has all the defensive zoned in on this loose head prop who's coming in. Most other teams don't have that, yeah. and I think. Um, I'm not saying that the the Australian tight five showed any massive skill set, but their work rate they massively outworked the, uh, the 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 All Blacks, and I think that that gave Nick White like a really good platform, and it freed up the likes yeah. of Hooper, you Forever. know, and, and and the back row as well. Then yeah. To, to yeah, it's going to be a different test. Eden Park, which is just an absolute hoodoo for the Australians. If they do well there, then I'll take your point. But playing against 14 men is going to be easier. Um, but 
making it absolutely fair across the board. The stats say, and there we go. World Rugby's rankings are battle. hilarious. I know, but if they lose by sixteen points, do you not need a set of glasses and stuff? Going, the stats yeah, say, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like Rodan's the thing. Yeah. 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 Bear in mind how much you have to just celebrate how great New Zealand are. If they lose by more than sixteen points, they're the fourth weekend, in the world. They go to six. Ah! Imagine that. Any Kiwi mates, you'd be there going, oh yeah, six. They in the go world, to mate. six in the world, and obviously World Rugby rankings are legit. Obviously, absolutely. That's a trapdoor. Yeah. Um, back to England. Do do you see England coming to the boil at the right time, or do you think? Because I, I remember someone saying to me about three or four months ago, the extraordinary thing about this England side is they could win the World Cup and they could go out in the pool stages. <laughs> you're not entirely sure what you're going to get mm. from them. Do you see the beast reawakening, or I wish is, I know it's one result, and I know that, but but looking at the way they perform, how fit they look, and the squad they've picked, yeah, they're definitely they're they're 100 in the mix. If 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 you're considering the box. And you're considered to be potential potential World Cup winners at the moment. I think that England could match them. Mm. Um, I think the difference is it's almost like in Ireland or I think that England as a nation, you kind of go in and no matter what it is, if you're going to a football World Cup and you've got the shittest team, you'll be like, oh, we're going to win the World Cup. Yeah. If you're going to a rugby World Cup, you're like, we're, you genuinely have got a good chance. It's just sometimes that hype gets gets beyond it a little bit, you know? Yeah. It's um, coming home, Jerry. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, but it's <laughs> but uh, the, the definitely the belief won't be won't be a problem. It's just keeping keeping a pretty even keel on things going through it. I, and I think to be fair, I think I think Farrell as a captain will do really really well. I think yeah. he's a, I think he's a phenomenal player. I think that they've the spine of that of that English team being Saracens. I, I can't understand how Alex Good isn't there, man. That guy is a f- he's a phenomenal player and he's a footballer. He is he is exactly what you want. He's the guy who creates the bit of magic, who creates space. Rather than just having guys who are like it's it's important to be a good athlete, but Alex Good is just a phenomenal rugby player. I <laughs> don't know how he's not gone out, but you, you did spend good time in St Albans. Oh, yeah, there'll be a lot yeah, of people yeah. out there that agree with you. What do you like about the squad? Typical northerner, you've gone with the downside first. Yeah, I know. That's uh, such a northerner. Yeah. Um, well, winter's coming, Alex, so you've got to prepare for these things. But I think when you look at the strength in says in the middle of summer. They're fit. They're proper fit, yeah. which I'm desperate to see for a fair while. They've had unity. They've got the youth coming through. They're looking strong. Probably about time with how well the England under-20s go. Um, and I think what you got with Eddie Jones is a master tactician, and fair play, he's not English, so you have to say, well recruited. You've got a man who's going into his third World Cup understanding completely how to... 16 sh- wins from 18 World Cup games. The guy's Stand. an absolute tactitioner and that's what you've got to admire. He plays games with the media frequently. He plays games with players. <laughs> he knows how to get people in the right mindset and I was looking enough to be down in Bournemouth when that Japan-South Africa game went off and, and he wasn't like that overly surprised by it. You were talking about the world's worst World Cup team against the world's best, South Africa-Japan, and he was the master tactitioner. He's now on England's team. That is exciting. Yeah, I like that. Sort of f- filling me with a little bit of belief there at that point. There we go. Um, who, are the, who are the players England cannot afford to lose? You mentioned Farrell, Vunapola. Yeah. Uh, D- does, it, does it hang on those two? I think Slade. I think Slade. Really? I think Slade. For me, like, you can play Manu at 13. Yeah. And he's, a, he's an absolute beast. <laughs> uh, he, I, I would start Manu at 12. And I would have, I, would, I think Henry Slade adds a bit of, a bit of nous, a bit of, a bit of, just that extra bit of subtlety around Joseph football. Joseph looked quite good on Sunday. He did well, for his first time yeah. in what sixteen it was, months. Sixteen months. Yeah. He Crazy. did, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm maybe not up to speed enough on him, yeah. but I just think Henry Slade is just such a good footballer, good. and I think he just gives something different rather than a guy who's going to just try and take an overs and run around you, or a guy who's going to run through you. I think that he creates space. He's a I think he was he was formerly a ten, wasn't he? He's played oh, a bit at ten, yeah. Yeah. Cover, isn't he? So 16, I think I, mean. I think I think he's important because he's so different. There's if they lose, if they lose fucking a thing that they can just put in some other some other wing who will do this, a similar job. That's yeah. not to be that's not to be disrespectful to what his abilities, but you've got certain guys there who can do things that others can't in, yeah. within the squad. I think believe on Apola. I think um, I think Jamie George. Uh, you know that that. Like I said, that Sari spine, yeah. And um, it's interesting when you're talking about that that you're happy that they're fit, yeah. Like, I think that when I when I've watched the Premiership, I, I just go, it's slow, it's so slow. And then when you play against 
uh, Exeter and when you play against um, against Saris, there's a marked difference. Marked, marked difference. Compared to everyone else in the Premiership? I think so, yeah. When I watch games there, yeah. I really? think that when Dunica Callaghan went to Worcester, he told me that he went over there. He might have been he might have been 117 kilos or something like that. And they said, 117 years old. He's been around for long enough. Yeah, but, but Dunica said, I said, how did you find it? He goes, when I, when I got over there, I said, listen, if you get to 120, 120 kilos, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy enough for you to hit, hit this, me, these, this many meters per minute when you're playing. If you go to 123, we'll handle this. If you go to 125, we'd be happy for this. It was about getting bigger and bigger and bigger because I think it's such an attritional league yeah. that bigger players last longer. But, you know, there's... There's there's a downside to that as well, you know. Did he go um, up? Did he go up the ladder? Donica? I think he went up a little bit. Donica probably would have Kevin done whatever whatever, they, whatever they'd asked for, but mm. I think that that that's where the marked difference is for 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 teams like Saracens and Exeter. They can play with real real tempo. Yeah. So I say the fit then. Here's one. I guess hijacking a question here, Alex. But as a coach, Dive in. first warm up game. Why would you go all in? You'd clearly just. From a Wales perspective? No, from, from an, a selection perspective. You wouldn't pick your starting World Cup players in the first warm-up game, surely. I don't, I don't get, my point is, I don't get the benefit of going all in for four tests before your World Cup, which is seven games in six weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can contrast that with Ireland, who, who gave a lot of lads, who gave, gave starts to lads who were probably on the bubble, probably not, not guaranteed to go out there, the majority of them. Maybe maybe it's because you said it's a younger squad. Maybe they're probably not maybe as uh, fragile as is 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 too harsh is too strong a word. But there's real momentum behind English rugby now going into the World Cup, and they yeah. probably they probably feel that they they wanted to go out and put their best foot forward to start with. I don't know the answer to this. Do you have to play in these warm ups players from within the squad? Great so if Eddie Jones it. gets the winning Cardiff and then beats Ireland. At Twickenham on the 24th, and he thinks, you know, I've got everything done that I needed to get done. I don't want to risk any of my players against Italy and Newcastle. Yeah, obviously. Do you, is that, is that, yeah, I don't, definitely. You, so you could just pick a ring as 15. Oh, well, why not? Why would you not? You've got, you got looking at a World Cup program of Tonga first, then USA. You love 2003. I know you keep talking about it. How many <laughs> players played in the first pool game that played in the first warm up game in 2003? Oh, that's a good question. That's a great question. How many, how many played in the first World Cup warm-up game in 2003, which that was played the France? Oh, well, I'm not that much of a nose. Well Whoa. played. France That's home, impressive. France, home, France, France away, Wales learning. away. He doesn't know the answer, though, so he's not that much um, of a I think most of them. Zero. Not one starting player from the first warm-up game played in the first pool game. And then 2007 I, was seven, uh, 2011, no, five. That's bollocks. The, Lawrence would have done. Or did he not play? Mate, Russ Petty doesn't get his stats wrong, does he? Can we actually give a shout out to Russ Petty? Yeah, I need to. He's, uh, he's, he's, a, he's a top the, man. If you are a rugby fan and you do not follow, what is his handle? At R. Russ Petty. R. Petty 80, R. I think. R. Petty 80. It's worth he is it. the greatest rugby statistician of all time. Second do you, greatest. Do you follow him? Rugby. I, I just after chatting to Rob, I thought I'd have to follow him. Yeah. So what he did on when the squad was announced... He, England, everyone's saying, why, why, um, why have England only taken two scrum halves? He produces the stat that says the third scrum half in the last, the, the amount of game time the third scrum half gets has decreased markedly over the last three or four World Cups. Yeah. So in whatever it was, four years ago, 2003. I can't remember who the first scrum half was, but um, anyway, they played 13 minutes. And only Argentina, the nation, to have picked two hookers and two scrum halves. It just like drops that in there. Like it's just mm. random information. When the it's amazing. Going, if you like oh. your rugby stats and you are a rugby norse, or on the sideline, follow at rpetty80. You will be surprised to hear yeah. Haskell is not a devotee. But that, There's been more rugby spoke about this podcast than probably about I've, 35 I've from last year. feeling quite giddy off the back of it. Oh, um, I just want to quickly ask you about the T.O. Brown knockabout in Treviso. Is that standard fare for seven weeks with alpha males all fighting for a reduced number of World Cup places? Or is that... There's a pub, mate. You expect I'm this, not, I'm not sure. Do you run security at Flannery's in Limerick? Do I run the security? Yeah. Do you stand on the door and if no, you're no, not I down? No, I don't, no. Oh, You've no, got the pipes no. fit, I get, I get knocked around. Just in case. Oh, they, um I James Lehman's scarred him. Yeah, yeah. I got knocked around by a football goalie. The um, yeah, you're gonna, you're it's it's gonna happen. I'm not sure what the context was to that. Apparently was it was a team the, social. Yeah, well, that's that's a bit different, isn't is it? Is it? It is a bit different because I suppose if they're out and if on a team social, someone's if if it happens in training when you're in contact, you can kind of go, okay, well, people are being competitive here, but if you're out for a you got to think of like. The team must come first always. That's the team must always come first. And if there isn't kind of harmony within the team 
and you're going out to something like a World Cup where you're going all the way out to Japan and everyone has to be really, really tight. You can't have anyone who's kind of who's not putting the team first. So maybe that's why maybe that's why they they didn't make. Do you it. think it's Do you think it was a, the, the the deal breaker, or do you think he'd already made his mind up? I think it's a nice excuse. Do you think? Yeah, I mean, this crap's happened all the time, and the fact he's been so candid about putting the guard up to not even talk one iota, <laughs> not one line in the media, no matter how much people are probing and probing, the guard is up. He doesn't want to talk about it. It's something probably petty. But knowing them both, they're not brawlers. Like no. everyone thinks Mike Brown, because he plays like a bell end, is a bell end. He's not. He's a lovely bloke. Lovely bloke. And Tio, same, like a really nice guy. They clash, clearly. I think they've had a bit of beef before. But team socials, you almost encourage that. If you're not giving each other shit in a team social, what the hell are you doing there? You need to be jabbing people. Is, is this like a fight? Well, a again, fight. there's nothing couple, really couple, known. On a, a night couple, out. A couple of, the yeah. NDAs are around, aren't they? Yeah, is that right? Allegedly. Yeah. I'll well, have to talk about it. That's not good. Really? No, well, but at the same so time, it's, it's it's a rugby environment with alpha males who have been training hard. You're going to have some friction. Um, interesting. We've got Chris Robshaw on next week. Arguably the nicest gent in rugby. I've got a good story for we went. Robbo and I went for uh, we did an event in Edinburgh on Friday. Event finished at three. Went to the airport at four for a ten past nine flight, which is a little bit of a it's a bit of a delay. Uh, got to the airport at four. Realised the flight was delayed until quarter to 11. Quite tiresome. Tried to book other flights. Looked at trains. Nothing quite happening. So we waited for the flight. Got out to the tarmac at 11.45. Waited until 1.30. At which point they said, thanks a lot, your flight is cancelled. Back in the terminal. Bought a 6.15am flight. Flew down in the morning. I'm too old for that kind of shit. Mm, No, we both said how nice it would have been to have a private jet. The nicest thing about Robert, though, didn't grumble at all. Just said, just dealt with it, you know. Can you ask? Imagine him? what Haskell would have been like in that environment. Well, he wouldn't have gone, would he? The um, question I got for Robshaw is: What is going on with him trying to look like he should be a it member looks of Steps? Fucking brilliant! Brilliant! He, he looks. looks like, he looks like a Ken doll, man. He yes, looks he looks like a Ken doll. Genuinely, it's it looked good. His Come skin, on, his skin is so perfect. Yeah, he's fake tanned. He's not his fake teeth tanned, are done, and he's dyed his hair. Well, he looks bloody good on it. Oh, right. He does look good. I give him. You could, I could give you the number if you. Well, maybe it's just envy. Maybe it is. Maybe it's just envy. The Northern Wear coming through. Um, we were talking about Ringers 15s, as in uh, this week's Guinness Perfect Pour. We're, we're sort of touring with the Guinness Perfect Pour at the moment. Our weekly test in 190 and a half seconds, because that's how long it takes to pour the perfect pint. Last week on the show, I, I'm going to say Hask and Tom Wood picked their starting 15s for the quarterfinal of the World Cup. In truth, it was, it was an utter shambles. But this week, we're going to ask you to pick a starting 15 of the players Eddie Jones hasn't picked and assess who would win a one-off match. Would you like to go first? Yeah, absolutely. I think we should bring back the probables versus possibles, by the way. This Wouldn't would that be, be amazing. Am- that would be a lot St. of fun. St. James's Park and sell it out. Okay, well, so that, yes. oh. Eddie Jones, non-15. One, Alec Hedburn. Strong. Two, Dylan Hartley. Yep. Three, Harry Williams. Yep. Four, Nick Ezekwe. Yeah. Five, Charlie Yules. Yeah. Six, Zach Mercer. Yeah. Seven, Don Armand. That will be a, that'll get a that. big cheer down Exeter yeah. Way. The Bristol fans, this one's for you. Nathan Hughes. Yep. Danny Kerr, obviously. Danny Cipriani, I put as captain and <laughs> coach, just so that interaction is going to be really awkward with Eddie. Um, Denny Solomon is my left winger. I've gone for Brad Barrett at 12. Wow. Because he has been a force for Saracens this year. I still think he's got a job. Yeah. And I didn't like the way that Lovely Pierce Francis was playing. Well. Yeah, I'm not taking that into account. Yeah. Alex Lazowski. He's annoyingly good looking as well, isn't he? Yeah. My right winger, a bit of a bolter. I like what you've done here. Christian Wade. Very good. Christian what Wade. A TD. Mm. Unbelievable. First touch. Guaranteed a million dollars this year. Shut up. Yeah. That's happening. Why? Producer Sire confirmed this. Because he is lit the field hasn't he he can't actually play for 18 months can't play a proper game for 18 months but he's still set to make a million dollars this year and then finally 15 Alex Good at fullback who's also underlined (laughs) social secretary does he have to play every In in the game in a bum bag not only that he has to go at least three days without taking his playing kit off that's a great shout which could be difficult for the four day turnaround they've got okay I've gone with it I was going to throw in Greg O'Shea just for pop culture, bit of Love Island. You got a guy with one point five million. You coached Greg O'Shea. Yeah, he was. Uh, for those who for yeah. those who are too old to know who Greg O'Shea Everyone is, everyone knows who Greg O'Shea I, is. I wouldn't have known that was his name, but I, I did know that he was a rugby player who won Love Island. Mm. Is he a proper rugby player? Yeah, yeah, he was in the in the academy at Munster for I think, I think he did four years in the academy because he, I possibly his last year. I think he he 
he cut his Achilles tendon when he was on holidays on a bike. Right. And uh, so he was, a for, I think he was afforded another year and then he kind of went into the sevens, into the sevens program. With, yeah. And uh, he's been touring with them. But yeah, he was, he's a really good guy. And I, I felt a little bit smug when he won because... Everyone, everyone's saying how sexy he is now, but I knew he was sexy years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that is a t-shirt. No. You've got yourself a t-shirt. I Greg said, O'Shea, I knew he was sexy years ago. I, uh, I was out for, out for a, a meal with my missus and uh, she's there. Oh, we'll go home. And I said, no, no, no. I said, I, w- I want to go down to this pub. And she goes, why? I said, one of the academy lads is uh, having his 21st and it was Greg. And she's like, what? what are you going down to it for? And I was like, I said, I want to go down and wish him a happy 21st. <laughs> So I went down and Greg was down there and he looked really sexy and <laughs> <laughs> and it was there were thronged around him man and he was uh and that was it so I was there I knew from the start he was sexy so yeah, when he went when into the show he's actually for what my for what my um my understanding of a Love Island contestant is yeah like I'm probably going to stereotype them a little bit but Greg smashes all that because he's an unbelievably good bloke really really, really good guy really intelligent uh, a good rugby player too so and he's trained to be a He's a solicitor, yeah. He's a solicitor yeah. as well. Mm. Jeez, sounds, what sounds, like, sounds like well, Is he going to go back to rugby? Or uh, too busy on daytime TV? And, I'm not uh, sure. No, he is. Sure. Opening nightclubs. He is, he is training. So they've now got their golden ticket. They're back on, well, they're on the World 7 Series. So they're going to be travelling the world. It's just annoying, isn't it? He's got, he's got 1.5 million Instagram followers now. So Crazy. How well is be on this going, look who's on the 7 Series. We've got mm. King of Love Island. It's that probably the only amazing. place where he won't get that who, much exposure, though. Yeah, really. he can he can get get back to business. Mm. Who did he who did he couple up with? Amber. Amber. Amber yeah. Good knowledge. You got a point. Um, your England team. Yes. Mine is going to be heavily reliant on the English teams that we analysed last year. <laughs> Good. That is a very decent <laughs> place to start. Then. So, Excellent. And and Saris. Okay. Yeah. And Saris. But a lot of the Saris ads made it. So I went for Moon at Loosehead. Yeah. Although Hepburn. I like I like Hepburn. Yeah. Um, I went with Hartley at, at two. Yeah. Uh, Harry Williams a tree I went with Dave Ewers as my front lock yes yeah. good shout he is he is a serious momentum winner and he is that I don't know has he got some sort of issue with his with his upper back yeah, yeah. It's, it's too big he's he he looks like a tight up prop but he, mm. he is he's a, he's a warrior uh, I went with Nathan Hughes so I'm going to be quite slow off the ground in my line out to start with so Nathan Hughes is in as you've the you've stuck him lock. in at the row yeah interesting Brad Shields yep. is probably going to be my, my, my main liner option. Kvesic at seven. seven. Simmons at eight. Good Sam shot. Simmons. I think he is yeah. he is one of the best players I've seen. Playing really? Well, Why is he not getting more of a, sh- a knock? Well, obviously, he, he did his ACL yeah. last yeah. year. Yeah. yeah. And But when, when I watched, when I watched, um, when we, we played Exeter in a, in a preseason friendly and that guy was phenomenal and all of their plays were built around his his acceleration and ability to to win collisions and uh, then when he did his ACL I was like oh thank God then Kvesic stepped into not yeah. thank God I felt bad for him but in a way selfishly felt thank God yeah. for Munster Kvesic stepped into his position Kerr at 9 Cipriani at 10 yeah I'm I'm a fan of his going forward but I think defensively he's got an awful lot of work to Put do him on the wing He's Torley right. oh yeah Torley Good yeah. Shout. yeah very very powerful Bolter uh, Tio and then the easy one to go for at 13 is Joe Marchant but I went with 12 trees because I think that in terms of in terms of keeping the team tight and glue, I think that he is the guy who keeps Gloucester together I'm, I'm impressed with him he's good skill set he's yeah. a warrior Mike Brown I'm a big fan of Mike Brown really aggressive on the field on the really wing. good in the air I'm freeing up Alex Good because I'm going to have two playmakers now either side of the ruck well we've done that square wheels though Brownie <sighs> st- listen when, if you've got if you if Kerr is hanging box kicks up you're going to have Brown getting up into the mix yeah. every single yeah, time well, yeah well it's, it's kicking game mm. coach you see I, w- I went I pretty much say Moon Hartley Williams Yules uh, Ezekwe Shields I went Rob Short 7 friends. just for old time side personal friends friends, friends. Uh, Nathan Hughes at 8 Kerr Cipriani uh, Ashton at yeah. Tio Lazowski Solomona I'm, I'm surprised Solomona didn't get more of a run if you're looking for X-Factor players I went Brown at 15 because mm. I think it's going to be an aerial World Cup which side is going to win out of an amalgamation of that lot and Mako George Sinclair Law uh, Cruz Itoje Laws Curry Billy V sort of answered the question while asking it yeah. uh, Youngs Farrell Tio Manu Elliot Daly uh, we're going to get pumped this yeah. team I have here is going to yeah. get pumped. so he's got it we're, we're happy to say Eddie Jones has got it right. Mm. 
Bar That's the thing about England, though. I mean, everyone's saying, oh, what about so-and-so and what about so-and-so? If you have the biggest playing pool and you have 12 teams that are competitive in a, in a competitive league, you're going to have players who star week in, week out in the league who don't get selected. It's not the same as Ireland, where you've got four provincial sides and therefore you've only got, whatever, your 60 players on the field at any one time. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or not? Well, I think the advantage that Ireland have is that is Contracted. It, it's it's the, the central contracting and the fact that <clears throat> that the majority of the like eight to nine of the Leinster team are probably going to start for Ireland. Yeah. So you've got that alignment straight away, and I think that England should really lean on what Saracens have gone on there. Yeah. And then and then just just add in the add, add in, in the extra quality around it. What's the news on Joey Carberry? Um. Still still waiting or well. They said there was no break. Whether hopefully it's not a syndesmosis. He looked he looked pretty pretty uh, distressed coming off the field. But I thought he was I thought he was excellent when he played. Yeah. Um, but he's he's not only important because he's back up to Johnny. He's also important because I think he could be. I think that that Joey gives a a really good option at fifteen as well. Yeah. Like there's if you look at it, you've got Rob Carney is is the nailed on fifteen. He's He's, he's proven there after that then they're probably next up is probably Jordan Lamore who has going forward is is outrageous yeah but he probably hasn't been tested enough I thought, thought he played well at the weekend it was a terrible game against Italy in general mm. um, but I thought he played well I, I, I never felt he was really tested we didn't see his the strengths of his game but we didn't see any of the things that you were kind of worried about like there was no real contestables there that were that, that were yeah. he, he took everything yeah. so you'd like to have seen him tested more but I think that if you had Johnny Sexton and you had you had Joey Carberry on the field at the same time I don't know whether Ireland are going to do that and that's probably me now transitioning from coaching into being that dickhead who stands on the sideline and goes <laughs> you, you know should what, be you know what you should be doing and they're like well you know how much training time is involved in now trying to bring Joey into 15 trying to get him up to speed to 10 but then pull him back to 15 yeah, so. you sure you're not northern, mate? That's one of our catchphrases. That you know what you should be doing. You know what you should be doing. <laughs> do you know what I forgot to do? I, I've got two accolades for you. I wish I had a trophy. The two two accolades for you. The first is that having worked in rugby for fifteen years, I would give you the accolade of the only person who it is worth interviewing in game. The only coach who ever gave anything of any interest during the game. Oh, Pat Sanderson. Um, yeah, Alex he's Sanderson. not a coach. Uh, Sorry. Okay, yes, you are in a minority of two Alex Donaldson is good that's a very good chap in fact I was actually going to throw it out and say who else out there John Fogarty lovely bloke mm. not a very good in-game interview Sean Edwards yeah well when do you ever hear from him true thanks for coming uh, the second is the only coach ever to help the players warm up in a pair of white slip-on shoes <laughs> this is what I'm doing the, the pulling that with CJ that is some of the greatest footage I've ever seen ever it's pretty embarrassing and I made sure that I have an S&C coach bracing Do, me every time can you just explain minute. to people what in God's name was I mean you were basically being ploughed around the field in the warm up in a pair of oh, ice hold on I ice, was, I'm getting, getting ice ploughed <laughs> well you weren't you were like so water serious. skiing behind CJ stand on one of those sort of bungee things got wearing a just... pair of ice white slip on shoes with your monster tracksuit ignore the euphemisms on this show yeah what I actually had was for for the viewers who aren't aware is that CJ Stander, one of the number eights at Munster, he does a warm up where he he takes two heavy heavy thorough bands or elastic bands across his chest and he goes into like a bear crawl position and you need uh, you you need someone pretty strong then to actually try and brace and <laughs> give him resistance. He does so, yeah. And and what he does is he's, he's trying to get all fired up. He's trying to get his glutes fired up and. Uh, he works out to the 15 and then he comes back in for an, an eccentrically comes back controlling it all the way back and I went out there with some rubbish pair of like ice white slip yeah, on yeah, shoes yeah a pair of Gucci Very Gucci Miami loafers <laughs> and held onto it and just got got ran down the field and some some dickhead had it on his yeah. phone and then sent it into the independent and it was like look at Munster <laughs> rugby coach Jerry Flannery getting not getting ploughed, but <laughs> getting dragged along the field. And I was like, oh, I can't go back at them here. So I I just give out to the S&C department that Chain there's up. no one there to back me. Well done on both of those accolades. Not being proud on, on yeah, whatever it was. Um, do, you, do you miss the buzz on, on a sort of a little day-to-day basis or? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I miss, I miss, I miss all that. Like, even when we finished up the season, we the coaches all came together and we did a wash up and we did all the th- all the areas in our department what we did well 
you know, what we would stop doing and then what we think will, will, will really add value. Yeah. And I was doing it, I was like, I'm not actually going to be there next year to do it. And I was like, oh, fuck. Because I think for, for the five years that I've been at Munster, it's actually probably at its best position. Munster's yeah. at its best position um, in terms of the underage. You know, you see, the Irish system doesn't, it doesn't facilitate short-term success. So if your team is not good, they won't allow you to go and say, I'm going to sign six six foreign players now and just drop yeah. them in. You're, well, because, you're allowed two. You're allowed two on the field, is it? Or? Uh, well, you can have as many South Africans as you want. It's, it's you can't have, it's, it's Kiwis thing. and New Zealand. Yeah. Uh, or sorry, Kiwis and the Aussies. Aussies. You can only have two. But the RFU, are, are, they're so leaning towards, the, towards the, the national team that they're not going to say, well, Munster are struggling. You can't just sign seven or eight foreign big name players and drop them in there. Now, financially, I think that that would be a challenge as well. But there's enough people out there who, who give a shit about Munster enough that they will put the money behind it. But yeah. but Munster is, you know, it's 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 main in, its main thing is 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 almost like a feeder to the national team, and it's working. Yeah, that system works. So it puts an onus then on and and the the whole thing about about the Irish <clears throat> provinces is that most of the kids who grow up who live in live in Munster they don't want to be professional players they want to play for Munster same in Leinster Ulster and Connacht so we already have a little bit of a competitive advantage there it's just to really harness that you need to really strengthen the pathway from when a kid picks up a ball to when he plays with Munster senior team so as I saw now our our academy is is firing at the best it has done yeah. so there is there is a lot of quality to come through over the next couple of years but whether they we've been to three semis three yeah. European semi-finals in a row and people are kind of going like, if you just had a little bit of luck. And I said, well, you have a little bit of luck to get to three European semi-finals. Yeah. Like when we played extra in the group stages, Billy Holland makes an outrageous line-out steal. If he doesn't make that, we're, we're, we're conceding them all, Try. So I think that, uh, that for Munster going forward, I think that, you know, I, I'd love to see them win a European Cup. Yeah. Do I think they will this year? I think they can. Yeah, I think it's if the probability is probably yeah. not that they'll do it. There is something very, very special about Munster. Love it, and I, we the, get clobbered for it on Sky. But but if you if you deliver storylines with the regularity and with the drama that Munster have done over the years, you, you get you get a pat on the back for it's it. It's the big post as well, isn't it? Irish by birth, Munster, Munster by, by the, the grace, grace of God. God. You're yeah. thinking that's brilliant line. It's like the old Fijian support. Stand up and brilliant. fight. And yeah, the, the, from, from my from where do you where feel I'm it saying? as a as a part of it or yeah, is it, yeah, or is you, it so getting, intrinsically getting more riled, mate. I'm stuck next to me yeah, it's uh, you definitely feel it you definitely feel like you're involved in something special and you know even the, the Glasgow game after Axel passed mm. like that was I took myself and Felix Jones we would be best friends he was the attack coach and and we just both said to us if, if, if we never do anything else uh, in rugby after this that was worth it for that game because that was just you know Rassi said to us before the game, he said, listen, he said, you buried your head coach today. He said, that's like, rugby is a, playing for Munster is a, is a privilege. It's not a burden. He said, you've had the hardest week you'll ever have in your lives. Go out and play. And to see the players play like that and to see the support that was there, it was just, it was incredible. Mm. I, I still, I can't, fa I can't, I can't articulate what it, what it felt like. And then, to see then when we played the New Zealand Maoris coming up and, and Rassi oh, and God, Jack, yeah. uh, Rassi Erasmus and Jack Nienaber, they probably weren't up to speed with like the touring, the the history of touring teams coming to Ireland. They said like, oh, we'll just put out like a Mickey Mouse team. I said, no, you don't understand. This is so massive to us. So then we ended up, they pitched it to some of the lads who were in national squad and they said, we 100% want to play the Maoris. And we had some guys going out there who, who hadn't played maybe two games for Munster in the squad. Some of them hadn't even ever played. Mm. And they went out and beat the New Zealand Maoris men who were, I don't know where they're ranked in world rugby, but oh, they're they, they right make up there. a semi-final, right? And it's, 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 uh, th this is a two-edged sword because in a way, like I love the fact that guys who might never play for Munster again, they get a chance to go in there. They put on the jersey, they're like Superman. They win, they beat the New Zealand Maoris. That's it, they're in, they're in Munster. I said, you've got a chance now to go into Munster history forever. Yeah you can shortcut yourself into that and and they did it it's amazing the, the the other side of it then is I kind of feel like it feels hollow to me because we haven't won something in so long you know and that's that kind of gnawed away at me all the time and I probably found that harder I, I, I speak to Raj and Paulie quite a lot Paul O'Connell because they're coaching as well now and I, I bounce things off them and they just said listen 
it's going to be a lot harder for you when you're a monster because you care so much about it mm. that it it um it wounds you so much when you lose whereas it's not that they don't get wounded because they're they're naturally competitive people but it doesn't it doesn't affect your family it doesn't affect your friends as much and the the positive of that is like when i played at monster when we won like everyone was happy it was amazing like you lift the whole city you lift the whole the whole province and uh as opposed to like if you just have a normal job you make a few quid you come home to your missus your missus goes all right whatever and just get on with it that's what the the cool thing about playing with monster is but it it definitely felt i felt like we were i i, I felt like a deep I, I feel like it's it's part of you because we yeah but because we never because i never won as a coach it really it really it bugs me it bugs me a lot it fucking pisses me off <laughs> don't rile him mm. Mm. Can I ask you about Axel? I mean, we, we were sort of about to say goodbye, but actually, I mean, he was such a talisman for, for Munster. Does his presence still loom large? Is it still, you know, for someone who's played with him for so long? And, and he was, he sort of seemed to be the elder brother to, to so many of you. I mean, I've worked a lot with Alan Quinlan, who, mm. you know, it, 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 he, he just sort of was deeply, deeply, deeply affected by it. Yeah, well, I suppose like... Uh, I probably would never have reflected on it until Axel passed. Yeah. And then when I when I, I was sitting there like and and thinking and thinking about the effect that he had on my life and he he almost paved the way. Like when when I came into, into St. Munchens, my school when I was when I was twelve, Axel was the captain of the senior team. I think he was he was playing number eight for the Irish schools team, marking Jonah Lomu, who was playing number eight for New yeah. Zealand schools. And I remember him walking around the school and I was going like, oh my God, look at that guy. And everyone knew he was the best player in, in the country. And uh, I was really proud that he was from my school. I didn't know him or anything. And then when I went to the pub then over the next couple of years into my dad's pub, all the old lads would be chatting about Anthony Foley. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. And I see that the kind of the respect that he had from all these guys. And then I went on to see Axel playing for Munster and playing for Ireland. And... Uh, and then when I was lucky enough to get to play with him, you know, it wasn't normal for me. You know, it wasn't like it wasn't like he was just a teammate. He he almost still felt like a little bit like, like, revered. Yeah, a little bit like that. And um, and then, you know, whenever Axel spoke, he he probably kept his distance. Distance. Uh, there was a bit of distance between us as as players that probably wouldn't have been there between himself and Woody. Himself and Woody were best mates. Yeah. So I had a, a kind of a different relationship. Like I still looking up to him an awful lot where Woody probably saw him as as an equal. And uh, then, you know, he helped me an awful lot when I, when I got into the Munster team and into the Irish team and obviously gave me my, my opportunity to get back into professional rugby as a coach as well. So to to lose him then was just, I don't know what, how, how you call it, man. It was just like, it's still to me like like it's surreal that it actually happened yeah. it was all so crazy but it's life he's a remarkable man mm. and part of a remarkable club and a remarkable province and you know it's sort of yeah but beautifully put and mm. and I know that he, he is so revered still and, and is, is part of Irish rugby folklore and, and long may that continue mm. thank you very much indeed yeah, it's been really, a pleasure. really enjoyed you coming in. I'm sorry we didn't get to talk that much about you. There are so many other things that I want to get into, but we will do that very soon. In the future, yeah. Please come and see us. Um, you'll be back down, like the yo-yo. The yo-yo, yeah. What do you, what's next on your agenda? Japan for me, sir. Are you? Yeah, 27 when, when days, go, doing the group games. New Zealand, South Africa on the sideline. Hang, hang about, because we're going on the 15th of October, I think, for our live shows. Funny enough, someone messaged me this week to say they heard last week that we're going out to do sh uh, live shows in Japan. He said he's booked flights off the back of it. He said, we're coming home. on the f We're going to be out there from whatever it is, the 27th to the 16th. I said, <laughs> Was it Haskell? I said, we get there on the 17th. He's like, OK, we'll right. extend. Um, okay. I can't remember his name, but he'll have front row seats. DJ Wooden. Comes. That is it for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for listening to The House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our friends at Guinness. We are a YouTube show and a podcast. As a surprise, don't forget to download and watch our boxing show, TK with Carl Frampton. What a bugger that was. Oh, mm. my God. Do you follow him? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's pretty sad. He'd have him. I know. He'd have him. Would you? you got no, the pipes. kill me, man. Kill me. Come on. That's wild. This Irish is all life. aesthetic. Um, Carl, get well soon. Uh, don't forget also to subscribe to Liquid Football with Kelly Cates, the wonderful Kelly Cates. Mm. Uh, Cates, thank you to Jerry for coming. Thank you to Rob. Uh, we've got Chris Robshaw with us next week. Hashtag friend. 
happy. <laughs> I got here. I'm in Cornwall. Friend. I'm flopping about on my longboard in the That's surf. The I think Hask might present next week. No. That is well worth tuning in for. Have a good in the meantime, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.